Before I introduce the main speaker for today, Jimmy Bartlett from Demos, to talk about radicals. I'd just like to say a few words about uh, futurism, to provide the context for what we're going to be discussing. This is London Futurists. Futurism has maybe three great disciplines. One of them is descriptive. We try and think ahead and analyze the possible futures that may be coming. <coughs> we look at them in terms of credibility. All right, is this more than just a Hollywood scriptwriter's fantasy? Is there some uh, potential technical basis to this future happening? We look at trends. Trends often have a surprising characteristic. They start slow and disappointing before they move fast and exciting. And we look at factors which might make trends dive down, slow down, with brakes, and other factors which might make trends accelerate. And we look at possible intersections of trends. Some of the most interesting features are when two or three different disruptive trends are in play at the same time. So that's the first discipline, the description of credible futures. The second discipline of futurism is prescription rather than description. It's a view of thinking, do we like these futures? Is this a future that would be good for us as humans or bad for us or possibly good for us if we were to change some of our attitudes or bad for us in various other ways? So it's not just about tracking trends and using spreadsheets and forecasting. It's more a matter of philosophy, ethics. And the third discipline of futurism moves beyond figuring out which futures are credible and desirable to thinking, how can we make these desirable futures come around possibly more quickly? And how can we stop the undesirable futures from taking place? So this is activist futurism. Not every futurist is into activism. There's the opposite, which is armchair futurism, in which people think about the future and get entertained about thoughts about the future or even might put bets on what might happen, but they're less interested in getting involved. But if we take seriously the view that the future is not determined just by technology, <coughs> if we set aside technological determinism, then what happens is in some ways up to us, up to all of us. And that's why this third discipline of futurism is thinking, well, how actually could we make this change? If we think that certain technologies should receive more investment and should be developed in a particular way, how do we make that happen? And activism itself is split into sort of two types. There's the insider activism and the outsider activism. Insider activism is where we work inside existing <coughs> large organizations, companies, political parties, whatever, in which we try and uh, gently tilt these existing organizations to be more in line with our views. And if that works, it can be very powerful, because these existing organizations and parties often have tremendous capabilities and resources, and if they take on the ideas which we advocate, then that can be a fast route to changing the world for better. But often these existing organizations and parties, corporations, they're caught up in various <coughs> types of inertia. They've got their own processes which have been very successful in helping them to do what they wanted to do in the past, and they may not be adaptable easily to switching around and doing new sort of things. There may be mindsets which prevent adoption of new ideas. So that's why a lot of the interesting changes in history have come about not just inside, but by outsiders as well. Outsiders who lack the scale and lack the resources, lack the huge movement, initially at least, that could happen if they were inside, but they're still in various ways able to make a remarkable impact on the world's trajectory. And that's what we're going to be looking at today in this uh, analysis of radical outsiders. And we can learn a great deal, I believe, from looking closely at some of these radical outsiders of the present day. We can find out what it is that they have done, which either has succeeded in uh, helping to change public opinion, helping to orchestrate energies, and in other cases, what they have done that backfired and was not successful. And whether or not we agree with all the radicals that are covered in Jimmy Butler's book, and it would be a strange person among us who were to agree with all of the radicals in that book, uh, whether or not we agree with each one of them, we can certainly learn a lot from what they're doing. So I'm very <coughs> interested and excited by this book. I think this adds another set of uh, examples to us that we can have in mind. As we talk about the future, we can say, all right, 
we've had these science fiction metaphors, we've got these examples from Hollywood, and now we've got a better understanding of what real world radicals have done and have failed to do. And who better to tell us about it than Jimmy Bartlett, who is sort of a, an outsider inside of his own, has been inside Demos, a very significant political think tank, uh, education think tank, maybe he'll describe it better. He's been inside that for 10 years trying to steer its direction, but he's also got a whole bunch of fascinating connections to outsiders of all sorts. And he's written about them at length in his book, which he has a few copies with him, so if you're desperate to get your hands on a physical copy, and if you're in quick, then you might be able to get one from Jamie, or if you prefer bits to atoms, then you can probably get one online by having it afterwards. So having said all that, I'd like you to welcome Jamie Bartlett, uh, director from Demos. Thank you. Thanks so much for the introduction. Thank you all very much indeed for coming. I've, I've spoken to the London Dietrich before, about 18 months ago, when I'd just come back from my very first research trip with an American transhumanist. And that's going to be the first story that I tell you in a moment. And the first transhumanist I've ever met is sitting right here if I'm allowed to say that to this fellow, about five years ago, up in Manchester for a pirate party political conference. He said, I'm a transhumanist. I'm like, what on earth is a transhumanist? And please tell me more about it. And ever since, I've been fascinated in the movement. Let me tell you quickly why I wrote this book. So I have been working at this think tank, Demos, for the best part of a decade, which in think tank years is about 150, because everyone leaves think tank after two years, except for me, who just carries on. And in that time, and the reason I joined, and indeed the reason Demos exists, is to try to get more people interested, excited in thinking about politics. When it was founded in 1992, the notion was that people were losing faith, confidence, and trust in politics. And Demos was founded to understand why and see if that trend could be reversed. And on any measure, we have utterly failed in that endeavor because things have got so much worse since then. Although actually in the last 12 months, you might see something's changed a little bit because turmoil and threats and difficulties is a great stimulus for engagement in politics. People don't like to accept that, but it's true. And really that's why I wrote this book because over the last decade, I've seen the stats, I've watched the tumbling statistics from every single polling company about trust or confidence in politics, the justice system, the police, the media, with growing alarm. And you may have seen this one knocking around on Twitter, quite a terrifying statistic, really, which is the proportion of people that believe that it is essential to live in a democracy by decade of birth. And if you can, you will be, your, you're very clever, you're probably the smartest group of people that I'll get to speak to on this entire book tour I'm doing. So you can work it out for yourself. But those born in or after 1980, it's just the same direction. Less and less people believe it is essential to live in a democracy. I don't know what else they're suggesting, by the way, that doesn't cover uh, that. But there you go. And the same statistics, you can see them, that people can be trusted or confident in the media, trust in government and so on. And so it struck me that even though in the last year, and I started writing this book in 2014, so long before Brexit and Trump and all the rest of it, but it struck me that these sorts of statistics were clearly given, giving an opening for different types of political ideas to have sort of find fertile ground. There was clearly an opening for people that were proposing something really quite different to how we do centre-left and centre-right politics in this country, and indeed in Europe. And what I wanted to try to do was to understand what those ideas were. Some of, and, and the way I sort of defined radicalism, which is of course a relative term, radical to what, I laboured over the definition. Any definition I use for radicals is going to be wrong and people will disagree with it and say, well, it should be this and it should be that. But I decided in the end to come up with a quite a loose one. 
this Overton window idea that political scientists talk about was my kind of starting point. The idea that there are a set of generally agreed wisdoms and ideas that those in positions of political, cultural or economic power within a society tend to sign up to. And indeed that you need to sign up to in order to get yourself elected. And it's norms about welfare, about the justice system, uh, about uh, representative democracy, about foreign policy, which have not changed that much in the UK or indeed in Western liberal democracies for the last 25 years or so. But last year, things were starting to just move a little bit. And my starting point was the groups that are outside that Overton window, the people that want to somehow fund, quite fundamentally change the, the norms, the, the way that we run society and politics. So it's a very loose definition. It's very fuzzy at the edges. But more important than a, than a tight definition, really, was a collection of stories. I wanted to go and spend time with these people. I wanted to live with them. I wanted to see what they believed. I wanted to understand the motivations. What is it that gets people up in the morning on Saturday at 5 a.m. to go somewhere to protest or demonstrate when they know nothing really is going to change? How on earth do people keep doing that? I wanted to understand the motivations. I wanted to understand what people get out of being in hopeless, radical political movements. And actually, the idea that in the end, it will be radical movements that are the kind of motor of progress in society. It, things, I mean, the lesson of history, of course, is that you know, all the ideas that we now take for granted were once upon a time considered to be absolutely crazy and ridiculous. That's not to say that everyone in my book one day will be seen as the same as the suffragettes or John Stuart Mill or anyone like that, but that it will be from the fringes of current politics that we will find some of the important and interesting ideas of tomorrow. But above all, I wanted to write an enjoyable book that was fun and that got people thinking about politics because politics books are so boring. So my thinking was, let's write an interesting one about people and their stories and their adventures. So I'm going to take you through a couple of the stories in that book, and then we can discuss it. And I should start with the transhumanists, because we're at the transhumanist war. Some of you, I believe, are members of the transhumanist party here in the UK. And the book starts, and it, indeed chronologically for me as well as the book itself, with Zoltan Istvan leader of the US Transhumanist Party. Does anyone know Zoltan? Not personally, but know who he is? Former leader. Former leader of the Transhumanist Party. Some of you. Most of you, maybe. OK. I'm not going to explain what... Do I, need, I don't need to explain what a transhumanist is, do I? Because I guess most people... Well, I'll give you a really simple one, but I'm nervous now because I'm speaking to the, the world's experts on transhumanism. So if I can give the simplest definition, people who believe that we can and should use technology to radically improve uh, and extend human capabilities, physical and mental, right? And it's a morally good thing to do that. That is like the one line description. Maybe we can talk about descriptions in more detail afterwards, because I'm sure some of you disagree with that. But anyway, this is Zoltan. And uh, back in 2004, <laughs> The late 2014, I think this probably was, he told me that he was planning to set up an American transhumanist party, run for president, and in order to get some coverage for this obviously quite outlandish political campaign, he would be building an immortality bus, a 1977 Wonder Lodge that he repurposed to look like a coffin on wheels, and he would travel from his hometown just outside San Francisco all the way to Washington, D.C., where he would, just like Martin Luther, bang a kind of transhumanist Bill of Rights on Capitol Hill building, which would talk about the rights of robots and the importance of longevity. And his pitch to voters would be, vote for me and you get to live forever. So when Zoltan told me about this, as a journalist, I was obviously thinking, well, there's no way I'm not going to be on that bus. I mean, this is the most interesting thing I've ever heard in my life. I have to be there. Now, I think this should work 
It's a little one minute teaser that he put out before any of this started, right at the very beginning. Let's see if we can make this work. Hi, my name is Zoltan Ishvan, and I'm the 2016 US presidential candidate of the Transhumanist Party. And I'm going to be driving a 40 foot coffin bus across America, promoting transhumanism and life extension. It's something that's going to work. It's something that's going to wake up America and get people thinking that perhaps we don't have to die. Perhaps we can use science and technology to overcome our biological mortality. The immortality bus is a wild idea to traverse the United States. Uh, hopefully getting people to think about um, using science and technology to overcome aging, to overcome death, and to uh, embrace transhumanism. We're going to have campaign drones, we're going to have a robot, we're going to have virtual reality gear on board, we're going to hopefully have a biohacking lab on board. I mean, it's going to be crazy fun stuff. Please support the immortality bus, please support my campaign, and let's hope this 40-foot uh, this, uh, cotton bus can turn into a big success and uh, really get people thinking about how we can uh, use science and technology better in our lives. All right. So what self-respecting journalist writing a book about radicals would not insist upon going on this bus? So I turn up to Zoltan's house on the day that this campaign is about to begin. It's going to be three months travelling across America, as per the video. He raised all the money he required on that Indiegogo site, $26,000 or so. And there it was, this beautiful coffin bus, ready to go. And I was expecting loads and loads of other transhumanists to be on the bus with him. That was the kind of pitch. But it wasn't other transhumanists on the bus, it was loads of other bloody journalists like me. <laughs> because every other journalist was as fascinated in the idea of a coffin bus travelling across America promising eternal life um, as I was. So along we went, we went to Las Vegas where he delivered a set piece speech, we went to a biohacking lab where he got an RFID chip implanted into his hand so he could unlock his iPhone and we, I met a load of biohackers, although I learned that there's a bit of a dispute between biohackers and transhumanists so I got involved in the kind of small detail politics of that and Zoltan talked at great length about his political programme Prison drones, we could release everybody from prison and we'd have a fleet of drones that would follow them around so they'd be reintegrated into the community, but we could be sure that they would be safe. Universal basic income, because at one point fairly soon, the growth of machine learning, um, artificial intelligence is going to render millions of jobs unnecessary, including middle class jobs, and we need a welfare system to deal with that so we'll be able to basically use universal basic income to pay people to live so they have something to do. Radical life extension, getting rid of the military and replacing it with a scientific industrial complex which would end ageing within a generation. And of course the purpose for it being called the immortality bus is to raise awareness about the lack of investment in longevity research by the government. Fascinating stuff, and just as a kind of interesting aside, well, more than an interesting aside actually, because it's central to the whole thesis of the book. All of the things that he was talking about, I thought at the time were completely ludicrous, ridiculous. And even in the last two and a half years, I started to think no, some of the stuff that he was talking about, especially the role of machine learning, artificial intelligence, might actually be right. And you've seen the amount of suddenly in the last six months, I mean, this word machine learning, and I've been working on machine learning at Demos for five years. Nobody ever knew what the hell I was talking about until six months ago, where suddenly everybody is talking about machine learning, which was a branch of artificial intelligence. And now we have Silicon Valley billionaires behaving like preppers, worried about the possibility of some kind of social breakdown because of what artificial intelligence might actually do for society. And so the message for me from someone like Zoltan was, wow, you know, so often it is people like this that have something to say about the future. And in a decade's time, we'll look back at Zoltan, I think, and say, well, some of the things that he was saying, and he's not, of course, by any means the only person talking about this, was actually right. We should have listened to some of the stuff he was saying 
think about it. Anyway, there is the immortality bus and me on it with some other journalists, as I promised. So we travelled along, we travelled around, we did lots of interviews. Zoltan you know, is there getting his little chip implant and we were all clustered around. You can see a microphone thing there because everyone wanted to see it really close up. Now this is the, th this is the thing, this is the kind of kicker of the story and I'm going to give away how this chapter ends. So I'm travelling around with Zoltan and obviously this is a media stunt. Zoltan admits it's a media stunt. He knows he's not going to win. In fact, he probably knows he's not going to get the transhumanist party on any of the state ballots because it is so difficult in American politics. And he says to me perfectly openly as we're driving around, I know this is a ridiculous media stunt, but I have no choice to get any kind of coverage in American politics I had to put on something wacky and crazy. And I know that's risky. I know that could backfire. But what choice do I have? Well, he played it like an absolute genius, frankly, because the amount of coverage that he managed to get for this bus tour was absolutely staggering. Because every journalist, I mean, I left the bus after Las Vegas and another journalist came on, and then another one. And every single major outlet covered this story in the same way because they were so excited by this. The immortality bus. Tech's going to help us live forever. He's running for president. What an amazing story. And we had all these dreams about being, you know, David Foster Wallace on this bus and writing these really great thoughtful pieces about, you know, the role of technology in society. I mean, this is catnip for journalists. This is a really great article, if anyone hasn't read it, in The Verge. The New Yorker. I mean, The New Yorker wrote an article about it. Salon and so on. Every single one. The tra there's a transhumanist political party, and Zoltan is running for it. Now, if any of you actually know the details of this story, and some of you will, you will know that there was no such thing as a transhumanist party. It didn't exist as a legal entity. And I was contacted by another transhumanist in America who'd seen I was on the bus, who said, do you know that there's not actually a transhumanist party and that Zoltan has been breaking the law by claiming that he has a transhumanist party and raising money claiming that he is the leader of the transhumanist party? Would you like to see the details of this story? And of course I did. I looked into it and it's true. There was no transhumanist party at all. Zoltan had set up a political action committee called the Transhumanist Party and was running as an independent candidate, which anybody can do. Did BBC check that? No. Did The Guardian check that? No. The New Yorker's famous fact-checking department, did they check whether there was actually a Transhumanist Party? No. Salon? No. Did I check? No, I didn't check either. I only found out because someone phoned me up and told me. Why didn't we do our jobs as journalists? None of us. Do you know why? Because we were so in love with the idea of getting on a bus with a transhumanist in a bus that looked like a coffin and travelling across America talking about living forever to check the basic facts. And that is actually what is happening in journalism today in a kind of world of so many competing stories, the outrageous stories, and so many journalists, many of whom are desperate for commissions because there's no money in journalism anymore, are looking for these exciting stories. And the, expe the expense of checking the basic details of those stories. Now the question I suppose you can ask is, does it really matter? Because Zoltan's wager and that's why I called this The Transhumanist Wager. His book is called The Transhumanist Wager, derived from Pascal's wager. And it basically says a transhumanist should do everything in their ability to extend their life as long as possible, and anything else is a waste of that life. And his wager in 2016 was to run for president and put on a wacky stunt, a risky wacky stunt, really, to try and raise awareness about transhumanism. 
And did he succeed? You're damn right he succeeded. Transhumanism, I think, reached millions more people than it, than it had ever done before. All at the cost, though, of essentially breaking FEC law. But he won the wager. He brought the message of transhumanism to millions of more people. Now he's moved on. Now I think he's running as a libert... Maybe he's planning to run, I think, as a libertarian candidate for the governorship of California. But I think movements, outsider movements like this, need people like Zoltan at the beginning. People that are brave enough and bold enough to take those sorts of risks, to bring the message to millions more people. And then once he's left the scene, that Overton window that I talked about is slightly widened and then other people will be able to move into the space that he's created. So I think Zoltan has done, oh yeah, this was, the, uh, <laughs> this was the kind of response by some of the slightly disgruntled transhumanists seeing the amount of coverage that Zoltan had been getting. And essentially, you can see, and essentially kind of turning transhumanism into Zoltan's movement. And I understand that. And there was probably a little bit of jealousy, perhaps, if I can be so bold to say that, in this, because he had got so much coverage. But he has created that opportunity, I think, for transhumanism now to capture that interest and turn it into something else. So you can be the judge about whether you think that the wager that he ran worked. I think that it did. And I think, as a result, transhumanism is going to be much stronger for it. Now. I want to move on to something else now, a different story, but I don't know whether, is it worth talking about, the, about this particular story now in the group? Because we do have some sort of interested people right here, or I can move on to another story and we'll save it all up. What do you think? How, how's people doing? Are you ready to go? You want to hear more about other radicals? And then we can uh, feed all the comments in at the end when we've got an advantage of a, a richer... Uh, All right. Spectrum of All right. Let's do that. Let's do that. Let's do that. Okay. So we can move on from transhumanism. And I'm going to give you a short story here. It's not even really a story. It's a few tweets. And it's an experiment, really. Because one of the chapters, straight after transhumanism in this book, we shift to the English Defence League and Pegida, the kind of anti Islam groups that have been growing across Europe for the last few years. And I spent one year with, so I had a great year, right? I mean, I really did get to spend time with lots of different people. I, I was with psychedelics people. I had to take magic mushrooms for the first time on my chapter on psychedelics, which was really interesting. But the second chapter is about Pegida. And it was Tommy Robinson, who the former leader of the English Defence League, who for one year tried to found and start a respectable version of the English Defence League. His idea was that the English Defence League, which had been knocking around since 2009, was not very respectable. There was too much drinking, there was too much partying, there was swearing, chanting, it was rude, it didn't appeal to the middle classes. He looked over at Germany, saw Pegida in Germany seeming to be a respectable movement that people listened to and wanted to recreate a version here in the UK. And I travelled across Europe with him and some others that were starting this movement with him to see if he could do it. Did he do it? Yes. Pegida UK was more respectable than the English Defence League. There was no chanting, there was no drinking, there weren't so many offensive banners, there was no fighting, but the problem was there was no people because they were the reasons that people liked being in the English Defence League. They enjoyed the drinking, the fighting, the arguing, the chanting. You know, this is a kind of social movement. Those weekends, nobody who, anyone who hasn't spent time with groups like the English Defence League doesn't really understand the appeal. It's a social movement. It's fun. It's a weekend away. It's England away. It's England supporters on the road having drinks and partying and getting into trouble. It's th uh, we were in uh, Denmark, with, I was with Tommy Robinson and a couple of others and we got attacked by anti-fascists, they were throwing bottles at us, one of them came over and tried to punch Tommy, Tommy punched him, uh, the police interjected, then we, had to, we were chased, we got into a taxi, we screeched off, it was so exciting, 
like that's the thing it was hilarious it was exciting it was fun it was exhilarating and whenever you read accounts of these far-right groups and far-right is a slightly unfair term for them in some respects but not in others you miss all of that all you ever see in the news are photographs of angry skinheads pointing and shouting it, but it's not like that when you're in it that's not to say that it makes it any less morally problematic or not to say that it's horrible when you're on the receiving end of the things that they do but from the inside to understand the appeal you have to see it as a social movement a way that people come together and have a fun weekend now one of the things I noticed with my time with these groups was how different their information universe was to mine and you've probably heard this, the echo chamber stuff, that you surround yourself with similar stories and then you become absolutely convinced that your view is the right one and it's self-corroborating. But I can't tell you how powerful an effect that is and how deeply that affects your view of the world. And to show you, I wanted to just try, if I can, I mean, the last time I used the internet here, it was an absolute disaster, so... I wanted to see if I could actually show you Tommy Robinson's Twitter timeline live. So you can just actually see what it's, what it's actually like and the stuff that gets shared. Uh, here we go. So, there you go, it's live. You can see he's just popped up a new tweet. So I, don't, I can't tell you right now what, he's gonna, what this is going to say. I haven't looked at this. But I just want to give you a little example of the sort of things that someone like Tommy Robinson shares very, very... Uh, I mean, he is an incredibly well-connected individual. Groups like this are, they are brilliant online, they're always online, they're constantly sharing stories online. He tweets an awful lot, he has a huge number of followers, and he is very, very active. So I'm going to go through a couple of his tweets, and you can see, and I want you to try to imagine what it's like if this is all you ever see every single day for five years, these are the stories with which you have surrounded yourself because that's what it's like being inside these groups. And you'll note that they are not, I don't know, and, and I, I, I've kind of got to apologise in advance because I have no idea, he might be saying something really rude and mean, so this is a bit of a risk, okay, but you're adults, you can handle it. Okay, Tommy Robinson goes to court on Monday, here's how you can help. So Tommy Robinson is always getting into trouble with the law. He has been arrested and um, acquitted more times than anyone that I know. It's, I don't know that many people that have been arrested and acquitted. But he is constantly in trouble with the law for various reasons. And the group, with some justification, sees that as him being prosecuted unfairly by the state who are afraid of the truth of what he has to say. He says he is calling out sort of systematic Islamization of the UK. He says that the political and liberal elites are afraid to admit it because they don't like to admit it. And that as a result of him and his activism, he's always getting shut down by the police for doing that. And he shares that very frequently. But it's not just about... You'll notice it's not just all about Islam. It's about a legal system that is fixed, rigged. They talk about a two-tier legal system that's rigged against ordinary people and that young girls and young people are constantly being like, abused by people and no one's ever listening to them. So it's never just tweets about Islam. It's a kind of much broader... So One of the reasons Le Pen is so popular among these groups is that she refused to wear a headscarf as well. And so one of the things that, that is very common in the narrative of these groups is that we, the populist right, as the media slurs us, are the only people standing up for Western traditions and values of liberalism, of secularism, of true free speech. And everybody else doesn't. It's only us that has the courage to do that. And it's amazing when you go into these groups and spend time with them, that this is such an important part of their story, that they consider themselves to be the defenders of Western values, not, as many others see them, the people that are attacking those Western values. 
And they always will have, and this is the key thing about the internet in particular, they always have an absolutely vast number of stories to demonstrate that. And they're not stories from these weird little conspiracy theory websites. They're from places like, this is from The Independent. So I'm just trying to get you to sort of see, here you go, the sun, pedos are still walking free in Rochdale. This became an enormously important story for the identity of the group because Tommy Robinson had been talking about grooming gangs in Rochdale six or seven years ago before anybody else was. And you've now seen what has recently happened and come to light and they all believe this is just another bit of proof that guys like him speak truth to power, they're brave enough to talk about this stuff when nobody else wants to, and they are being proven right. And I'll give you one more example. He doesn't like Mehdi Hassan very much. Sheer extremist and Islam's pathetic apologist, Mehdi Hassan, retweets praise for Iranian president, but slags off Trump, his supporters, all day. Now, it is like day after day after day. I have spent years following this guy on Twitter, and you know, there's hundreds of people like him that are just constantly sharing all of these stories. And if you want to understand the mindset of the group, how they see themselves, what they think is important, what they believe their role in society is and how mainstream society views them unfairly, this is a good place to start, okay? And it's not as simple as you think. Okay. All right, that could have been worse. That could have been worse. That passed off without incident. <laughs> so my final story, <coughs> my final story, here we go, yes, okay, so you of all people might be one of the few that have heard of this place Liberland, because there's a bit of overlap with transhumanism, has anyone here heard of Liberland? You're by far the most knowledgeable, no one else I've spoken to yet has ever heard of this place. So. Final chapter in the book, and in some ways the most radical of all. Here is a map of Croatia and Serbia. Um, and due to an arcane border dispute between Serbia and Croatia, this tiny seven kilometer square patch of land, which is actually called Gjorna Siga, is disputed, but not disputed in the normal way because Croatia says that it belongs to Serbia, and Serbia says it belongs to Croatia. <laughs> so the only, th I mean, you just could never imagine that, could you? But the reason is, just so you know, the current border is basically the Danube River. Croatia says, no, we think the border should be this one. This is the 19th century course of the Danube River, which puts all of this land into Croatia and this tiny bit into Serbia. And Serbia says, no, 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 no. We're quite happy with the Danube River, thanks very much. And so this has become um, one of the only bits of land outside of like, the Arctic and a tiny bit of land on the uh, Saharan Desert that is not claimed by a nation state. And under very vague and loosely enforced international law, the first person that turns up at a piece of unclaimed land can claim sovereignty over it which is what Vit Jedlicka, a 30-year-old libertarian from the Czech Republic, did two years ago, stuck his pole in the ground and said, I'm declaring this the Free Republic of Liberland, the first truly libertarian country in the world, actually a narco-capitalist country in the world, where taxation is voluntary. Any tax that you pay will have to be based on voluntary arrangements agreed between people themselves, even for the roads and the education system and the sewage system and the infrastructure. You, there'll be no restrictions whatsoever on what you can put into your body, on what you can own, on what you can say, on what you can, whether you want guns or not. We will have a tidy government that can basically be overturned at any moment because we want it to be as toothless as possible. And citizenship is voluntary. You can come and you can go. And if you want to be a citizen, all you really have to do is sign up this form, promise that you're neither a fascist or a communist, and, uh, and then you are eligible. And there's 200,000 people now that are eligible citizens for Liberland. So I was fascinated by this because I, it got me thinking about the nation state. 
Because to me, the nation state is just a fact of nature. Like, we all live on, in nation states. You know, that kind of a bit of land where there's people that share some common characteristics and there's a single sovereign body that has authority over that land. But it has a complete monopoly over the way that we live. Everybody lives in a nation state. And there's no alternatives to that anymore. And it's a very modern invention. A couple of hundred years ago, there were hardly any nation states at all. And people lived in all different types of ways. And now, the only option you have is a nation state. And Witt said something to me which was brilliant, which I'd never even thought about. Imagine all of us in this room decided, you know, democracy rests on the consent of the governed, yeah? And I was like, yeah, 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 that's what I love about it. And he's like, okay. Imagine all of us in this room decided we wanted to start our own little commune. We're adults <coughs> and of our own free will and volition, we start our own little commune with our own rules and our own taxes. And we say to the nation state of the UK, thanks very much. We actually don't want your protection anymore. We don't want your services anymore. And we don't, so we don't want to pay taxes, but we don't, want to, we don't want to receive anything in response. So we're going to just go our own way. You cannot do it. It's not possible. You have no opt-out. And Liberland is a kind of uh, uh, an idea of having that opt-out, having a different way of trying to live with much higher degrees of freedom. Now, the only way you can become a nation-state is for other nation-states to say that you are a nation-state. I mean, it's a complete stitch-up, isn't it? I mean, it's an oligopoly. So... Witt and Liberland want to try to persuade other nation states to recognize them. And that means they have to try to look like a nation state. So I went to um, their one year anniversary, just over here, because we tried to get onto Liberland, but we got blocked by the Croatian. So you, they blocked all the roads in from Croatia. So we got a bus and we drove around here and we crossed into <laughs> Serbia. And then we came over here and we got a boat back to Liberland, even though we were like just here. And uh, the Croatian police stopped us. And we, like, we wanted to land because if we landed, I mean, what are the police going to arrest us for? Entering a bit of Serbia from another bit of Serbia, which doesn't make any sense. But so they don't want us to actually step foot on the territory. So they blocked us with the police boats. So we were having the one year conference here to celebrate the founding of this place, and it was like walking into a fully formed government, even though Liberland is not, there's nothing there, you can't get on the land. So they have ministers, they, have, they had a foreign minister, or they have hundreds of representatives from different countries, they're all wearing suits, they address each other like, Minister, you know, what is your answer about the taxation policy? Well, thank you for the question, Minister. Yes, I do have an answer. And they are acting in a way that makes them appear to be a nation state. And it, there's Witt, the president, with the first lady. This is their booklet that gives all the details, the constitutional details and so on. They've got a football team, they've got an aeroplane, they've got a beer, they've got a wine. And while I was there, they actually ran uh, the award ceremony for a group of architectural entries for how Liberland would look. And they won a big prize for this as well. Look at that. Wow. How about that floating stuff and everything? <laughs> uh, and, you know, and, and this is, I think, I think this was the winning one. And it's going to be powered by algae and all sorts of other amazing things. But what, what was so exciting about it was this idea that you've got this blank canvas. And you can imagine starting again now with modern technology and designing a society from scratch rather than with all the sunken costs that we have in our society. I mean, this is what it actually looks like. So it's, I don't know if you can see the difference. But, um, <laughs> but that was, to me, like I stood on the bank with Vit and looked over after the police had blocked us. And it was just like, for the first time, imagining something, uh, this canvas, this possibility of how what might we actually try to design a way of living together from scratch. And just having it there even, gave me that opportunity to think about that and think about fundamental questions about how we live together that I hadn't really considered before. And that's the final message, really. But the value of radicals in society is not just whether they're right, because sometimes what's valuable about them is when they're really wrong. 
I look at the challenges of the next 20 years, and as futurists, you're thinking about this a lot, I'm sure, and I see environmental problems coming, a sort of 20 years down the line, a crunch of environmental problems, much higher levels of mass movement of people, the artificial intelligence on jobs problem that we talked about under Zoltan, the crunch of public finances for our overburdened welfare and health system. And I think, is society, as currently formed with our centre-left and centre-right consensus, really set up to be able to deal with those challenges? And I'm not convinced by any means that it is. And the power of radicalism to me is not just that they are a motor of ideas, that they offer new ways of thinking about things, new possibilities, they force you to think for yourself. So even where you fundamentally disagree with what Zoltan's saying, or what Tommy Robinson's saying, or what Witt and Liberland people are saying, it's the stimulus of their thinking that makes the rest of us work out what we believe and hopefully respond to it. Because the greatest danger I see in modern Western liberal democracies is, is that we are reduced to a kind of narrow consensus of unquestioned dogmas about how we should live together. And that saves people the trouble from thinking for themselves. And radicals force you to think. They force me to think. And I'm in some ways quite excited about the future because all of these challenges are stimulating these movements. They're all coming about now because I think they share that worry about where society's going. So they force you to think. They force you to think for yourself. And for that reason, I'm, sometimes I'm very pessimistic. Other days, I'm very optimistic. But either way, for me, in the end, fu in the future, and even in the present, Radicals are going to play a really important role in our society. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much for listening. A fascinating set of stories, uh, Jamie. So in two years' time, if Liberland is open for business, will you be there? Or will you still be at uh, Demos trying I'm hedging, to... I'm hedging my bets. I have a free love commune that's agreed to let me back in as well if things go really badly. Because that's one of the groups that I was with because a lot of people are... Sort of back to the land movements are growing a lot at the moment. And I went to a free love commune who could survive the apocalypse, if you like. I don't know about you guys. Maybe you're different to me, but... If things went really badly in society, I am so reliant on systems that I don't understand. I don't know how to make good, like, clean water, sewage systems, food, nothing. I could order an app. I can order an Uber from my app. And what good is that going to be to me in, like, 20 years' time if things go really badly wrong? So I'm hedging my bets. I've got Liberland ready. I'm a citizen of... Well, I'm not actually a citizen of Liberland, but I'm hoping I will become one. I'll get back on the bus with Zoltan. So, yeah, it's been quite good for me. It's like a, it's a, I'm, a, I'm, I'm insuring myself against the future. <laughs> One more question for me, then we'll take <laughs> questions from the floor. So do you think we're open enough to radicals in this country, or is there too big a barrier to entry, for example, for new political parties? It's very hard for new political yeah. parties to be taken seriously because you need to do an awful lot of things before you get to, into Parliament. Yeah. Exactly. Douglas Carswell writes quite nicely about all of this as well. It's very difficult for new entrants into formal politics. It's also, I mean, in America, Zoltan was quite right about how difficult it is for a new party to break into the system. It's almost impossible. And it means so much power goes to the same parties, which so they basically have a bit of a cartel over it. So that's the formal problem. The informal problem is more about, and maybe this is what my book was more about really, is the is the informal social pressure to conform. So how we as a society listen to or take seriously or deal with respect ideas that are a bit outside what we're used to. Because that's as important as any legal framework, whether society is set up to listen to those ideas. And I don't think we are. I think we're too quick to dismiss anybody that's outside what we're used to. And that's such a shame. And my hope in writing this book was not that there'd be any legal changes to the p political system or the electoral system, but rather that as a society we would, we would just widen that little window a little bit so that we're all a little bit more open to slightly different ways of thinking. And that's all I can hope for with a book. You know, I know I'm not going to change the world, but, uh, yeah. So I've heard it said that the, the skill that's most missing from society is curiosity. 
that uh, it's not something that can be done just by throwing facts around. We're all very good at collecting facts to back up our opinion. And for every opinion, you can get lots of facts to back it up. But if we had more of a sense of a curiosity, we'd be more open to saying, well, why, why do you actually disagree with me? What is it that you've seen that I haven't seen? So let's take some uh, questions from the floor. Uh, see your hand right at the back. If I can ask you to speak into the mic, and then we I have just, more of a chance. I know, to this is I know you're going to be grilling me with some difficult questions. I can really feel it from this room. I can really feel it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, really enjoyed that. I, I, I missed the first story uh, as I came in late. But um, my question is, uh, you're a journalist. It appears to me that the biggest problem to critical thinking is the media. Um, it's a relatively new institution, has been set up to um, supposedly uh, give us information, tell us what's going on. Uh, but the monopoly it has on the views that are aired, that it, that it is possible to air, um, is such that because most people are just fed the steady diet of a particular view, they never really have to think for themselves. They don't have to question the sources. They assume the sources have, have all been checked. Yep. A fact, you know, um, an item that you sort of mentioned. Um, uh, so, what do you think the future of the media is? I suppose. Um, yeah, well. Well, I mean, firstly, there, there obviously, in the last decade, there, there's been a great fragmentation of media, and that monopoly over what people see and read and hear is changing. And I think that's one of the reasons why we have all of these different movements now in a way that I don't think we did a decade ago. So much of it is down to digital technology. I do agree with you. I had... I, the first story actually talked about the lack of critical thinking amongst journalists on the bus with Zoltan as he ran for president because we were too enamoured with the idea of writing these wonderful stories. And the other problem is the difficult relationship between journalists and the people they want to interview because as a journalist you're often worried about pissing off your sources and so you need access. So you don't always write the toughest stories about them because you won't get invited back. And that's certainly true in the political, in political journalism and technology journalism because no one wants to miss out on the amazing Silicon Valley parties thrown by Peter Thiel or whoever. And so, you, you know, it, it does exert a certain pressure on journalists. I have absolutely no idea where that's going. None at all. I can't predict it. I didn't predict anything that happened in the last 10 years in journalism. So I'm probably an utterly useless person to ask that for. But I think you're right. But I, I'd be a bit more optimistic maybe than you are, given the way that journalism has changed so much in the last decade, that there is room to be optimistic. And a few years ago, people were saying, don't worry if existing journalists aren't doing a very good job, because we've got this wonderful thing called citizen journal journalism. Anybody who, can, anybody who wants can start their own uh, blog, and they can get the news out. So whether it's something like Huffington Post or something yeah. much smaller than that. Has that succeeded, or is it being drowned out by the existing uh, Well, I think, it's, I think it is so early to try to understand wh whether it has or not. I mean, and the debate on this is just, is just sort of uh, going in circles. Like, whether there's more fake news, but that's also disrupting the monopoly over journalism, and then there's loads of really great citizen journalists, like Bellingcat, whose brilliant investigations in Syria have been incredibly eye-opening, but then there's a load of shit citizen journalism, and so... Uh, it, it's, it's, it's basically causing new it's disrupted journalism technology in the same way it's disrupting every other industry. And it's a shakedown, and we still don't know. I mean, I'm kind of hopeful that people are going to realise that high-quality, genuinely independent journalism is so vital for the future of modern liberal society that we will somehow come up with an answer to this problem. Already, actually, I think, and maybe I live in my own bubble, I definitely live in my own bubble, the last year or so, the question of fake news has made everybody think a lot about fake news and sources and who do you trust in a way that two years ago they weren't. So I'm kind of hopeful that even though everyone's banging on about fake news, everyone's now quite aware of it and is thinking about it and worrying about source material and where's things coming from and who do you trust. So even when we had, like, the, to me in society, uh, you, you go in waves and something really bad happens, but that forces everyone to think about it and then respond to it. And I think that's where journalism's going. So I am fairly optimistic. 
Okay, so so hello. Uh, thank you for for very um, interesting um, stories. I am still waiting for ideas at scale. For for me, the twentieth century was the uh, era of the most amazing social experiments at at completely massive scale. Mm. So if we look at things like, and I'm not saying that they were particularly good, but um, but but they were at scale. So if you look at communism and fascism and the way they took hold of societies and, and, and the way they, they, they sort of um, expanded and all the consequences, um, they were at scale because they had activists who in a sense weren't polite people. Yeah, they, they, they sort of, um, it was all kind of by revolution, by violence. And I think um, part of the, I don't know if it's a problem, but, but certainly feature of um, our, our society is that we want these big transformations to happen politely, uh, nicely, without too much impact, without too much upheaval, and, and, and without um, those dire consequences. And the history teaches us that, that unfortunately this usually doesn't happen. So my question is, do these people, um, do these uh, radicals plan for success? Or is it all a bit of a, a, a party? What would have happened if, if by, for some reason, Zoltan won hmm. the actual presidency? What hmm. would happen if, 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 if this is allowed to, 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 to continue? So, so that's my one question. Second question is logistics, because the world is so interconnected that even if you allow an experiment um, in an isolated scale to, to expand, then it starts interacting in unpredictable ways with, with, with all the other systems and, and what can, mm. can ensue there. What are your views on that? I have no idea about that second question. I literally couldn't. This book is meant to spark some thoughts among clever people to work out answers. They're stories, really. I, I, I mean, it's not an argument in favour of one thing or the other. But on the scale point, I mean... You know, in a sense, we're going to see, because Donald Trump was a, an outsider with a radically different set of politics, and we're now going to see what happens when he actually tries to govern. And I think that's quite, an ex in a strange way, an exciting experiment, because we need to see how different ideas actually play out. So I watch that very closely. The other one in this book is Beppe Grillo, who I've been following for years, since 2011. I wrote a long report on Beppe Grillo saying... This is an amazing new way of organising political parties. Is it going to work? Well, he's currently... And I interviewed him for this book, and I spent a lot of time with his party members, the Five Star Movement activists. And his party is now, um, according to most polls, is the most popular in Italy and would win an election if it's called tomorrow. And he governs in a quite radically different way. So we will see what happens when the radicals take over. And we've got to look very closely and carefully at that and what it actually means. Some of them do plan for success. I spent a lot of time with direct action environmentalists and they genuinely do believe that they can shut down production of fossil fuels and that that will expand dramatically. And I think they're right, but I think that that will happen when it's too late. So my view on the direct action environmentalists is that they've created a small culture of very like-minded people, unfortunately, that's high risk, that's a choice. They're activists, very irrational to be a direct action environmentalist. You take all the risks, you chain yourself to the machinery, you get arrested, and if it works, everyone else shares the benefits equally, including the people that did nothing. So this is a tragedy of the commons, a collective action problem. And so they're highly irrational people in a sense, and that means they've created this tiny little subculture that puts everybody else off, because everyone looks at them and thinks, those guys are really weird. And the problem is, then there's a nice contrast to um, the anti-fracking movement. They're people who've almost had activism thrust upon them by having a well at the end of their road, and they're worried about their water. And my worry is that environmentalism will become a mass movement in about 30 years' time, when all of us feel the actual effects of environmental change, at which point it's probably too late to deal with it. So this horrible tragedy about environmentalism. So they're kind of planning for success, but knowing that it's probably going to be too late. Just on Zoltan himself, no, he knew he, didn't, he wasn't going to win, but that wasn't the point of it. 
the point of it was to get as much media as possible to maybe help transhumanism rise up a little bit. You know, because Zoltan cares a lot about life, indefinite life for Zoltan. And he's 42. Average life expectancy in California is 82. And he estimates that rever like genetic reversal or reversal of aging is 40 years away. So he is in a really tight race for time. And anything he can do to kind of encourage the growth of this, I think, really matters to him. So for him, this was a great success. Uh, but that was because he had different goals. He never intended to actually win. And I actually, I did ask him this question. I said, if you were assassinated, Zoltan, and... Um, Transhumanism became the biggest, you were a martyr, and it became the biggest movement in America, and it won the election, and life extension became possible, but you were dead. Would you be happy with that? And after a sort of pause, he said, no. <laughs> no, I'm really interested in life extension for me. <laughs> so the thing about a lot of these activists, a lot of them are adrenaline junkies. Like, they love the thrill of being an outsider, and pushing for something and being different and being rebellious. And actually, if they won, I think they would want to leave and join another outsider movement again to have the same thrill of fighting against the system. So that's part of what drives these people on. It's the excitement of it all. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> Jamie. Is Jamie, thank you very much for your presentation. It was thrilling, I think, for all of us. Thank you. Um, uh, all your words make many connections, uh, like Beppe Grillo, Vandana Shiva, uh, about the environmentalists. Uh, oh, sorry, by the way, we'll have two questions now. All right. <laughs> sorry. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned Beppe Grillo and the way he won the elections in uh, in uh, in Italy. I was witness uh, to that period, and uh, that was uh, amazing. Uh, because also because I I remember um, Beppe Grillo uh, making presentations, speaking about Skype. Uh, M many years ago, like 15 years ago, saying, hey, did you know that there is, a pl uh, there is a way that you can avoid paying for calls by using Skype? I mean, this was his way of uh, going to, through this wall of um, uh, people not being interested in, in things, just going uh, uh, along their, their, their way. And after that, he won the elections, and um, um, he, he was uh, accepted by, uh, as, a, as a party, and uh, he's very powerful right now in Italy. Sorry, but my question is completely <laughs> different. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, talking, about, uh, talking about Zoltan and his ride, and the fact that you took uh, part in, in this ride with his immortality bus, would you have done it if uh, you had known about... Uh, the fact that th he didn't actually uh, have the party. Would, would you still have done it with him? Would yeah, you definitely. still... Uh, yeah. yeah, of course. Because, uh, I mean, I didn't really care. I mean, whether he's running as an independent, but promising this, or as the leader of the transhumanist party, made no difference to me whatsoever. The only objection I had was um, the fact that nobody else picked it up. Like, no other journalists had checked any of this. And, I, and it would just made me reflect on the, the fact that I think with a lot of outsider movements, journalists get very excited about it. They get carried away in the story. They want to write the exciting piece. And uh, they don't check the basic facts. And in a way, Donald Trump's a good example of that. Because secretly, j all journalists I know love him. Like, they love listening to what he's going to say. Yeah, they hate him in one way. But in another way, they're obsessed with him. They love his press conferences with his ridiculous statements because it's thrilling and it's exciting and it's different. And so the way that politics has been moving towards ever more sort of outrageous statements to gather uh, uh, a buzz about a story was just played out by Zoltan. And he did it very cleverly. Like He knew how to play the media and he, he beat all of us journalists. He tricked us all. And in a way, like good, well done on him for doing that. Uh, there is a parallel, a parallel between Trump and Grillo's squad, perhaps, if you can make it. Well, I, make, I think Trump and, uh, and, and Grillo is also another good parallel because they are the two people who are the best social media politicians of the age, frankly. 
Everyone in the 90s thought that politicians in the digital future would be like professors. They'd be thoughtful and they'd be intelligent and they'd be far-sighted and they would be informed and we would all be getting on very well because misunderstanding would be banished because we'd all be connected. But actually, it hasn't really quite worked out that way, has it? Uh, and overloaded with data and information and stories and facts and tweets and graphs and countergraphs, we tend, I think, to rely on heurist emotional heuristics. We share the things that are funny and stupid and we, we want to read what everyone else is reading and it's outrageous stuff that tends to capture the imagination when you don't have much time. And, and someone like Beppe Grillo, a comedian with like the best one-liners you've ever heard, is brilliant on social media. And so is Donald Trump. So I used the story of Grillo to show how the, the possibilities of digital democracy, that he has brought in hundreds of thousands of new people into politics. He has, in, like, he's infused millions who suddenly believe in politics again. You know, that they can actually make a difference. He's totally transformed the demographics of the Italian parliament. So it's younger, there's more women, it's all brilliant. But he is also a rude, obnoxious comedian who insults his opponents. And these are the, this, is the, this is kind of how digital democracy shapes up now. Amazing opportunities, but don't ever think that it's going to make it nicer or kinder. So should we all learn to be more obnoxious and funny? In order to if you want to succeed in politics, I'm afraid you probably so should. The, there's an awful lot of hands up. Let's try and go through some questions yes. and answers quickly. Alan? OK, so this is a follow-on from the earlier question about the role of the media, and your, your response was about the motive of the media at the moment. Um, so... Uh, how does it change with universal basic income, do you think, and how would it change for you personally if you got it? What would your role as a journalist be? I just don't think people are going to be willing to accept universal basic income. I really don't, because I just think the idea... Because it's not just that, it's the, it's the increased inequality that would come with it as well. If a small number of people have huge amounts of economic and social power because they run the technology or the platforms that run the machine learning stuff, and everyone else is on some UBI system. It just, to me, just everything else would have to change. And I'm not sure whether people are willing to accept the idea that they should be grateful recipients of something. Like, the people, there's some really good work on this, actually, that you should check out. Um, Will Davies, who's at Goldsmiths, has written about it a little bit. The people in, in Wales who are most likely to vote to leave were the recipients of the most amount of European Union funding. And the argument was that people actually resent being gifted things rather than kind of earning it themselves. And so they're not grateful at all. They're annoyed that they're getting it from someone, you know, from someone else's beneficence. So I would just worry about, I mean, I, my, the, what a journalist would do under a UBI, I think, is the least of my worries. <laughs> but these are questions for you guys. You're, you, some of you are the futurists, right? I'm not a futurist. I put together some stories. So you guys are going to have to figure these things out. Can I just address it? Sorry, because I think you basically didn't accept the hypothetical. So I, I wasn't interested in whether universal basic income would be acceptable. But how, if you had it personally, if I gave you money to live, how would your role as a journalist be? Would you be a better journalist, or would you stop being a journalist? Right. So how would, me, how would the media change? Just you personally, you know, would you be, would you, would you stop um, trying? Yeah. To yeah, yeah, would it, would it change my incentive? So would I, would I think I need to get a story with Zoltan because it's going to get coverage, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to not check the facts because I want to write a cool story? Yeah, I mean, maybe it would. Yeah, maybe it would. Maybe it would because I, so, I wouldn't be so reliant on clicks, so I wouldn't have the incentive to write these outrageous, funny stories. So possibly, yeah, yeah. I mean, but I'm, yeah, I, that would, I hope I would anyway. But I would probably still want to write the cool, exciting stories that people clicked on because you're motivated by more than money, aren't you? You're motivated by success and other people saying you're great. So I wonder whether money would, <laughs> would be enough to be able to, to change that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so oh, yeah, I, I've got a question about whether radical people are much more important than radical organisations. I, I, I'm thinking three weeks ago, I was at an event which is, has a number of principles which include radical inclusion, radical self-reliance, and radical self-expression. It's the South African equivalent of Burning Man. 
Mm. And Burning Man has been around for 30 years. Mm. And it is, by most definitions, a sort of a radical experiment. But it is just that, and it's isolated. There's no radical figurehead. In fact, it's very deliberately no one person who, who sort of is the, the chief burner, mm. if you like. Mm. Um, and so I'm wondering, given all the examples you talk about, Beppe Grillo, um, Zoltan, whereas, com conversely, I can't remember the name of the guy for Lieberland. Oh, Vit. Well, no, there you are. Yeah. I, I, yeah. That's, that's a, a supposedly radical idea or place, which is actually sounds very similar to a, a burn in a lot of ways. Yeah. It's, it's sort of semi-autonomous. So does this all come down to people, not organisations? Well, I wonder whether that I would say it does, but that's just because of the people that I've followed. So I've got this kind of writer's fallacy of, or the narrative fallacy of having done certain things and then deciding that's what, that's what matters. Oh. I mean, I think Burning Man has actually been hugely influential in a lot of ways. I do. Like, the, I mean, the, the effect that it's had on Silicon Valley culture, I think, is quite understated. I think it's the other way. Well, yeah, maybe, yeah, possibly, possibly. But, I mean, I, I was interested really in radical ideas rather than the people. Like, the idea of a society in which radical ideas are out there, talked about, discussed, treated respectfully, whether they come from organisations or from people. The only thing I can say, and this is a really difficult question, I've, I've never even thought about that, so I don't think I could give you a decent answer, is that even places that say they're leaderless, like the Five Star Movement, and they say we are a leaderless movement, it's such rubbish but they always have leaders and when they claim to be hierarchical and using digital technology to smash down hierarchies what tends to happen is that they're still leaders and actually they have even more control because no one knows where their authority stops and starts so I had this kind of interesting thing where Beppe Grillo who claims you know it's, it, it, Beppe Grillo's small clique of people still control the platform on which all the big decisions are being taken and no one can really know what's going on behind the scenes, but it masquerades as being completely open and transparent because it's online and it's digital and you can, everyone gets their voice heard, but no one really knows. So I know that's a bit of an aside because it's not quite what you're, you're getting at, but it, that's just about the relationship between sort of leaderless organisations. And I saw that again and again, and actual individuals that in the end, like with Zoltan, it needed that guy who was willing to do everything to get the ideas out in a way that I don't think the consensus committee of transhumanists or would have done. Or environmentalism, there's no yes. Mr. or Ms. environment. Not for, the direct, not for the direct action groups. And so that was the thing. And I've actually got a section in the book which says, with great frustration, I was asking everybody for the leader, like, who, am I, who can I follow? <coughs> who can I interview? <coughs> Excuse me. And there was nobody. And that was because I'm used to trying to find a leader. Not Naomi Klein? <coughs> yeah, but she's not really going out there and chaining herself weekly to machines like the people I was with. And they reject leadership. You know, they hate the idea that they're leaders. But there was always a leader there anyway. But they didn't like to say they were leaders. Okay. Question down here? Yeah, uh, <coughs> very interesting for me because I'm from Italy. I used to be a political journalist. I covered Berlusconi. I was censored by Berlusconi. Then I saw the start of the MI5 movement. And now I cover the media disruption in the UK. So it's <laughs> spot on. Um, the MI5, as, along with maybe Pegida, uh, Le Pen and others, rely on uh, a deep lack of awareness. So they're populist mob movements. And it's interesting because in, the, in Italy, for instance, MI5, the Oh, five star, you, the Five Star Movement. Yeah, the uh, movement. Right, right. Um, <coughs> MI5 is our yeah, of course, uh, but look domestic up. intelligence M6, script. Anyway, um, <laughs> there, there's a very, a, a very deep rift with journalists, as with Donald Trump. And what they have in common, I think, is um, um, the anti system in the sense that they don't trust anything that comes behind. It can be political culture, it can be journalism, everything that is media. So a mediation between. Mm. The, the instinct, people instinct, and institutions or rules or outcomes. The yes. result of democracy as we know it. Disintermediation. Yes, <coughs> mediation, exactly. Yeah. So, and what's worrying is that those people that I know, <laughs> some of them in the clique I know personally, um, they rely on the ignorance of many of their followers. So my question is, do you see 
the Do you know how ignorant the average voter is, though? Like, comparing it to what? Because, yeah. I mean, people that are the sensible people, and I don't mean that in a pejorative way, but the they're sensible people voting centre-left, centre-right because their parents voted no, centre-left, no, no, no. they don't, they, no, voters yes. in general aren't sort of s always super informed about everything. No, 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 I'm not saying that. I'm, I'm, I'm saying that that, that p political party in particular rely on, they want to change everything and they refuse everything. So it, it's a bit tricky because they just say whatever comes from an expert. So they're alienating not only journalism, but academia and experts of all sort. And it's happening all over the world, I think. So my question goes back to, do you see the education systems in, for instance, in this country, as pushing towards curiosity and critical mm. thinking or <coughs> conformism of every sort? Yeah. Which can, because you can be anti-system, very conformist by being anti-system. Mm -hmm. You just, you just are anti-everything. Yeah. You don't build anything at all. Yeah, yeah, and I do trend. talk about that. And you're right, that's a trend. Although people in, I mean, the, a lot of the people that, that I was with, they're very informed about stuff oftentimes. And the Five Star Movement people had knew a lot more about particular, but you're right there's also a, there's also an anti-system bias which means you throw a lot of good things out with it although with Beppe Grillo I always f felt that he wouldn't have come to much had it not been for the corruption of the previous Italian rape of Craxi and Berlusconi so so exactly it's a reaction and it's a reaction to a, to a genuine problem that was that was existing yeah exactly so so there is but so there is, there is a kind of cause there that, that, that is being responded to that's legitimate, that needs to be thought about. In the education system, I mean, I've written a, a few places, including at Demos, about the importance of uh, schools not just teaching coding and software writing and uh, how to use Microsoft, but also how do you become very critical in your consumption of information, like basically old-fashioned sort of critical thinking or media literacy studies because you can't rely anymore on the gatekeepers of truth. You have to be your own editor. I mean, and literally with a lot of young people, with all of us, we suddenly have responsibilities of a publisher. We've actually got to know about copyright and libel law and stuff like that because we're all publishers all the time. Do any of us know? Do any of, any of us learn any of this stuff? Do we get taught it? No. And we don't because the, the teachers didn't go into the profession learning about this stuff either, because none of this was a problem when they were doing teacher training. <laughs> uh, maybe I can compare the system in Italy and in the UK, because I have a daughter who's attending the school in here. And what's, what takes me aback all the time, it's, just, it's crazy to me, is that even if you go to the event, if you take some event, talking about education the system, the purpose of it all is that they find a good job. A job, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's no, I know, oh, totally. And it's Italians that and say that uh, education together or something. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. I mean, the problem is everyone always tries to force their thing into the education system. What the lady said, I couldn't hear it. Sure, yeah, so she basically said... No, on, people shouldn't speak unless they've got a microphone. Okay. All right. Yeah, the focus of our education system is often about getting jobs, not about the sort of citizen that you're creating. And, and I agree with that, and that's the problem. So we, we look at technology as the sort of... We're going to learn about technology for the jobs we might get. Although everyone's saying at the moment... We've got to learn computer programming and coding, but I think that's going to be one of the jobs that's automated by the time these kids get out of school. So I don't see what that's going to do to help. It's quite short-sighted. So I do believe that, and I'm hopeful, though, because I think the current wave of people coming into, educate, into tr teacher training are going to have quite a different view on this. So, so it will not like naturally we say, evolve, but we've got a lag, but I think it will change naturally. So in the future, as we say, everybody needs a basic understanding of STEM, science, technology, yep. education, uh, uh, engineering and maths, but we also need very much the skills that were previously derided as being soft skills, whether it's yeah. an appreciation of history, appreciation of uh, philosophy, appreciation of culture. It's only when we're all... A mini polymass that we've got a chance to cope with this very complicated world that we're in. Exactly right. Now there's a lot of hands up, I and we'll try and go through some of them, and maybe in groups of three. So you, yeah. So so. You're in charge of the mic. Can someone make sure they take a photograph of this, by the way? Someone at the back. So I've got a picture because I'm trying to, because I'm going around doing little events at different places. So I want to build up a little gallery of pictures. So someone, please take a photo and please tweet it at me. You got it. Yes. Radicals. Right. Uh, do we need radicals? I think we badly need radicals. The question is, will the radicals behave? Uh, history teaches us they won't. 
although we have one nice exception. Yeah. It's the Green Movement. Those who are old enough remember that towards the end of 70s, they were absolutely radical. And now look what happened. We have climate change. So it's not a lost battle. We may have good radicals ahead, uh, like Mr. Macron, who is a kind of a radical, although mm. following your definition, <laughs> yeah, it may be it, hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's my comment on the yeah. radicals. But yeah. <coughs> you mentioned also UBI, and you seem to be a great pessimist. I'm on the other side. We will have to have UBI. We'll be forced to have UBI because the alternative would be unimaginable. If you think how technological uh, unemployment will move millions of people within one or two years, uh, in 10 years' time, say, then the governments will be forced to um, in instill the um, UBI. However, I personally think, and I think we, we agree, that that UBI shouldn't be um, without any conditions. For instance, my preferred uh, view would be that there should be one part, minor part, that is not enough to sustain yourself, which will be unconditional, but the other part will be conditional on front learning, doing voluntary work, and so on. Because you're right, the most um, dangerous thing is that society will collapse mm -hmm. if people just don't do anything. Mm -hmm. Well, I can only Let say that we... Hold on, hold on, let's get oh, some yeah, more. Oh, yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah. Hi. Oh, hi. Hi. Okay, so I'll just... I don't know the scope of your book, but I'm assuming when you're talking about radicals, you're probably looking at the Western world. Yes. So, like, Europe, yes. America, Australia, Canada, yeah. that sort of scheme of things. So there is more to the world than just uh, the West. And I wonder what's happening in the West is uh, a reaction to... Uh, so the radicals must be working against something. So I'm assuming that that would be basically the establishment. So the establishment could include the media, could include politics, big business. And basically what the radicals are, are addressing are probably the wishes of a disenfranchised group of people who aren't being heard by the establishment. Okay, and the establishment can be a, a very much an echo chamber. And my feeling is that those who benefit or reward by being part of the establishment are happy for it, things to remain the way they are. And the ones that are losing out are the ones who are becoming radicalized, if you like. So I think I, I saw something quite recently. I, I'm not sure about the numbers, but it's like something like over the last 20 years, about 20% of Americans have benefited from the sort of socio-economical structures there, and about 80% have been losing out. I don't think those numbers are accurate, but I think it's probably that, that the majority are losing out and the minority are gaining. So with this conflict of uh, sort of establishment and radicalism, and I'm thinking about Lieberland in particular, if Lieberland you know, is a nation state, it's recognized and you've met the government, do you think they'd want to be part of the European Union? Well, that was a, that five, was a sharp turn at the end. end. I didn't think that was where you were going to go. <laughs> so if you pick one or two of well, yeah, so, uh, yeah, That was more of a comment about UBI, but I'll be fascinated to see where it goes, and I want to see where it goes. And I do say that in, in the final chapter, I talk about the dangers of radicalism, obviously. I mean, I sound quite Panglossian. Oh, it's all great, and all radicals are brilliant, and it's going to help us. But obviously, there's a, there's a dark edge to that as well, because they tend to be quite uncompromising about a lot of things. So I do discuss that, and I don't really have a direct answer for it. Um, I think you're right. I, and I do look at only at the West, or sort of Western liberal democracies with capitalist economies, because a radicalism, like I couldn't define radicalism in another way other than a, in comparison to a set of values. And if I started talking about radicalism in Saudi Arabia, I'd be talking about liberal Democrats and stuff. So I, I couldn't do it in any other way, really. So. Um, no, I don't think they want to be a member of the European Union. In fact, definitely not, because they detest centralised control, large bureaucracies. They are the opposite of that. They want to use technology to decentralise everything. Uh, they, talk, they call themselves, everyone says they're trying to create a tax haven because they have voluntary taxation, and they say, no, we're creating a tax heaven. It's not a tax haven. And they were celebrating the UK's departure from the European Union, which caused some controversy because a lot of sort of libertarians are also socially quite liberal 
and consider that taking the side of a party like UKIP is anathema to them. So there's always this tension with a lot of these sorts of movements between the ones that are sort of very anti things like the European Union, but are then worried that their social values might not be represented by the forces that have helped us leave. So, but no, they would definitely, definitely not join the European Union because they hate centralised governments. And the European Union is like centralised government par excellence. So... And is Macron the kind of radical we can uh, emulate? And he's uh, a real annoy nuisance case for me, isn't he? Because he's kind of not, and he sort of is. I mean, the, the, what sort of worries me at the moment is that everyone takes on the language of being radical because everyone wants to be an anti-establishment person now because the establishment's so unpopular. And so everyone, even the centrists, are radical, and I'm radical, and... Corbyn said his manifesto was radical and Yvette Cooper, when she was running for the leadership as a centrist, said, I'm the radical candidate here. And then it's like, I'm Brian. No, I'm Brian and so is my wife. And, you know, everyone's a radical and it just becomes meaningless. So I'm kind of, I'm, I'm a bit worried about the, the way that the language is being completely lost. And I hope I, with this book, trying to sort of re-establish what it actually means. Uh, actually, you're final comments lead directly to my question. Um, in everything that you've said, and obviously we haven't seen all the case studies, you've mentioned all kinds of things that we recognize as ideologies, left, right, center, radical, non-radical, establishment, non-establishment. Did you get a feel after looking at all these outside outlier radicalism, mm -hmm. how in fact um, that what is needed is to depoliticize everything, to remove the importance of ideologies. After all, politics, at the end of the day, is about distribution of interests, not just material resources, but interests, whether they're cultural, national, ethnic, or whatever. And the inability of politicians, as well as voters, to actually distinguish from a should, because they have interests or they have an ideological um, um, position, from an is in terms of what is actually possible by way of getting to you know getting people working together, material resources or mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. um, did you either get an idea from these radicals or do you yourself have a potential way forward, oh. even if it is within one polity like the UK, that that could happen? Oh, that's a big question. All I can say is I get very suspicious of movements that say they're not political or they're above left and right. And Beppe Grillo is one that has said that, you know, I'm beyond left and right. I, you know, those, those silly old ideas are no longer necessary. And um, Mussolini said exactly the same thing. I'm beyond left and right. This is about the interests of people. You know, this is about common sense politics rather than petty arguments over left and right. And it, it just makes me nervous, that, because I think that's so ripe for abuse. That said, yes, the sort of blocks of political interest, center, you're either centre-left or centre-right, is far too straight-jacketed. There's no room for manoeuvre, and there's not the ability for people to pick things from different bits of the political spectrum that they like, socially economic and, you know, maybe economically liberal. And so there is a reformation taking place in politics where the internet's helping that, but I don't think it ever really transcends left and right. Not in like tradition, because I think humans actually tend to be either leftish or rightish, or maybe it's like liberal-ish or conservative-ish in their makeup, and politics in some ways reflects that. But we can definitely have a much more, I think, fragmented and diluted type of that politics, but not one that goes above it. Because then people start saying, "And I represent the general will. I am the leader who is above politics, who represents the interests of ordinary people," and that is a Fast track to trouble. <laughs> Hello. Um, combined two comments c come up. Um, obviously, was uh, Zoltanistan's campaign and the very poor, poor fact-checking went with, with it. Of which I am guilty, yeah. too. So I'm um, co well, I mean, you use this to say, well, maybe this is media responsibility, me the media is not doing its job and uh, yeah. fact-checking it. Um, I would actually say it's not so bad in that case. Um, I don't know if you've seen, seen my project, H plus PD, I do it with David Wood. The transhumanists are now doing their own fact-checking. We uh, actually have reference material for everything we say and people are saying, controversial or otherwise. So the community itself has actually got, come on a long way, spurred by Zoltan. Oh, you campaign. guys have. You were the ones yeah. that, that spotted it and told the yeah, yeah. journalist, me, what was going on. 
So mm. you were doing my job. Yeah. So, I mean, I totally but, but agree with that. Now, this is now an ongoing project within the community of, of everything, trans, everything transhumanist itself. So maybe it's, it's not the mainstream media to blame so much as much as uh, a, a figurehead coming out of an obscure, obscure uh, disorganised movement, is my, my point. We should have at least checked it, shouldn't we? I mean, the, the, the <laughs> I mean, the basics of whether this party even maybe we all just assumed it had to have existed. Or I, but I personally think is we didn't care. We didn't care. We didn't want it to ruin our cool story. That's my reading of it. But no, I take your point. I'll be watching your project closely. Sounds fascinating. Yeah. Hi. Um, I just want to uh, address the first question and also the theme that's been running through all the other questions as well. Um, uh, there actually is already an alternative to the mainstream media and journalists, which I is actually opinion formers on YouTube. And there is actually at the moment even like a sort of like a battle mm. between mm. the opinion formers and the mainstream media. And uh, people like um, the Alex Jones channel, which has got, I think, make about five million followers, he actually was quite instrumental in helping Trump to get the presidency. And um, the other channels like Philip DeFranco, even PewDiePie, these people actually get more views and people listening to what they say rather than the mainstream media because people feel as if they know these people. Yeah. So I think actually journalism is, well, I don't know what's obviously going to happen in 10 years or so, but it, it's actually beginning to change now. Yeah. And there's actually a battle between these opinion formers and the mainstream media. For example, the with the Wall Street Journal and uh, PewDiePie's channel, who's actually, his name's Felix, but there was quite a big Saw battle, yeah, yeah, between him yeah. and all this about fake news and advertising. So there actually is an alternative, which the mainstream seems to be trying to close down as well. Yeah, I agree with you on the YouTubers. It's an amazingly interesting new set of people that most of us have just kind of ignored. And I've been desperately trying to get a YouTuber to like promote my book because I'm like, it will just become a bestseller if one of these, you that. and so forget getting reviewed in The Guardian. If I can get it in the hands of a big YouTuber, that's even better, but they haven't done it yet. You're absolutely right. Um, but, there, but someone like Alex Jones is a good example of the trouble and the problems that that also creates because he is a, I've had a debate with him uh, on, his, on his channel He's a big conspiracy theorist, and he quite openly sometimes admits that it's a persona. He puts his persona on because he also has his own commercial interests in selling stuff on his website. So he is not without, like when you're a YouTuber, you're not without financial interests either. You still have them, and sometimes they're even more obscure, and people don't even realize they're there. So I think it's, a, it's also about critically analysing and understanding, as us citizens should do, like what the incentives are for these different types of media. And so the journalists... And I think you're right that many mainstream outlets have kind of declared war on the big technology firms, and it's partly about advertising. That They're really upset that Google and Facebook are such big advertisers now, and you've noticed many more stories criticizing those companies from mainstream newspapers and I think that's partly underlying it's a war over advertising and that's the incentive and it's the incentive for the YouTubers as well so it's so important for us as critical reviewers of that stuff not necessarily story by story but understanding the ecology and the incentives within a media system to allow us to judge more accurately what's going on but you're right it's changing so much and people like me just used to think YouTubers are a joke but I mean they're really not they're so important for so many people. Hey, um, thanks for the presentation. So you mentioned Peter Thiel and you mentioned Silicon Valley, and so I thought that you might be in a position to actually answer to my question, which is like, can you somehow um, translate your findings from this political and socio-economical thing? I mean, movements? to like business and startups and disruption and innovation because I sort of have the idea that a lot of startups and entrepreneurs they are catering to the needs of the of the market as is today instead of doing something really disruptive or innovative and uh, and also I had the impression from your presentation that um, a lot of these very radical or very disruptive movements are in fact not very successful in terms of going mainstream or like you know like getting traction out there mm -hmm. because they are like they're the 
the degree of disparity between the very radical disruptive thing and the current thinking is so big that, as you said, it just opens a window, but it's not really going mainstream. So there needs to be kind of a convergence between the two. So basically my question is, like, um, if you consider this disruption and maybe the need for the convergence, and also that a lot of uh, entrepreneurs are just, I don't know, like catering to the current thinking of how people think today, how do you actually, who are the successful radicals or, or what can make, I don't know, how can you make disruption successful? I mean, that is a big, difficult question for me to answer. Some of them have gone mainstream. I mean, Grillo is an example. In a sense, Tommy Robinson's views have kind of come into the mainstream in a way that we didn't really think three years ago. And I think the environmental activists and the transhumanists will become quite a lot of the ideas behind them will become a lot more mainstream in the next 10 years. <coughs> and the idea is to get people thinking about it. I do not know how to translate that into stopping Silicon Valley tech entrepreneurs building apps to share photographs rather than building apps to improve the world. And if I can figure out a way of linking it, I will, because then I'll get loads of talks and the big companies will pay me loads of money to do those talks. And so I'll be, of course, interested in, in that as a problem. But, you know, a lot of the Silicon Valley companies have, they have the same problem that most businesses have. They are pumped up with venture capital money. They have to demonstrate growth. They have to start making profits fairly quickly. And so they're driven by the same market incentives that everybody else has. So they're also often looking for... Uh, people enter Silicon Valley to change the world often in a really positive way, and then they get investment, and then they have to start making money, and a lot of it goes down to advertising. So they're, they're driven by the market incentives as well. And I have no idea how you would change that, and it is way beyond the scope of what I could talk about or write about. Well, maybe, maybe then you can research more about what Peter Thiel is doing. I mean, he is a radical of a sort. He has he explained is. exactly as you have said, that too many people are trying to make their startups based on new photo sharing apps or pizza yes. ordering. He wishes that more people would uh, put their investment into healthy longevity or creating alternative systems of governance such as a seastead. Yes. It's a little bit like Lieberland except yes. it's out in the ocean somewhere. I tried to get onto a seastead. That was the idea. And I interviewed Patry Friedman as well, who runs the seasteading institute. He's the institute. grandson of Milton Friedman. Milton Friedman, yeah. So there are definitely some really interesting radical Silicon Valley thinkers. And actually, these guys are building the stuff that might actually really change the future uh, quite dramatically. You know, you change the technology and then you change norms as well. So you, you've, you've put together some really interesting concepts today. Um, thank you for that. The, um, the, the first thing you discussed was um, the uh, loss of interest uh, or, uh, or loss of investment in democracy in younger people. Yeah? Uh, then you talked about uh, transhumanism, which um, I think is a movement rather than uh, um, a political entity. Uh, and then you talked, when in talking about Lieberland, you talked about um, uh, nation states. And, and I just wonder whether um, radicalism uh, drives movements, and with technology, those movements are going to be global. And whether um, democracy has any kind of relevance in that kind of world, and whether the nation state has any kind of relevance in that kind of world. So I don't know if I know the answer to that. I mean, I do believe that the nation state, as we understand it, as invented essentially in an industrial age, with command and control economies and very easily manageable borders is not necessarily going to be the best model of living together in the future. Um, everyone who's ever lived in a system of government at the time thought it was always going to last forever. The Roman Empire would last forever and Charlemagne's empire would last forever. And then it didn't. And I think we might see the same with nation states for the reasons that you've said with the way that technology and the movement of people makes those borders extremely porous, difficult to control. Technology is going to mean that identity and loyalty to certain spaces is not the same as it used to be. And the inability of governments to be able to tax and control their population is going to get harder and harder. All of those things start happening. The very model of the nation state start, starts looking a little bit outdated. It doesn't quite work. 
And Liberland was just that one example of something I saw where they recognised those trends and said, the other one I actually did a chapter on here was BitNation, the sort of blockchain-based governance system. They're actually suggesting alternatives to it. And I don't know whether they're going to work, but I do think we, we should look seriously at them. And I really hope that Liberland does actually come about. So we have, John Stuart Mill said, we need experiments in living because we never know which ones we might need to draw on. And I'd like to see more experiments in living, and Liberland's an experiment in living, and I hope it works. And Vit believes, Vit Jed Bitschka, the president, believes that this year will be the year that some nation states will recognise Liberland. He's convinced, and I don't know whether they will or not, but he's convinced. But once that ball starts moving, it's possible. And hey, look, this is politics in 2017. Anything's possible now, right? I mean... <laughs> So I'll come back to the audience for a few more questions in a moment, but I want to dip into this question of beyond left wing and right wing, in part because it's a fundamental interest to the transhumanist movement. After all, the first person who wrote about, are you a transhuman, FM 2030, oh, yeah. uh, he, he, he said he's neither a left winger nor a right winger, he's an up winger. And, uh, I have a deep uh, nostalgia for the future. Yeah, so in uh, one, one sense it seems mad because of course you've got to come down on an economic decision. Are you in favour of redistribution or are you in favour of letting uh, market forces have more power? And that seems to be an inescapable choice. You know, are you an economic uh, liberal or an economic uh, mar market conservative? But I think uh, what people like FM2030 and others will say is that there are other dimensions to politics. It's not just uh, are you, where are you defined in terms of economic uh, distribution is also on, uh, first of all, on uh, uh, moral grounds. Uh, it used to be that people who were economically conservative were often socially conservative as well, and people who were progressive uh, politically were also progressive morally, and that uh, no longer is the case. Mm, you get yeah. uh, a complete uh, two-dimensional chart now. And transhumanists will say, well, there's another uh, new dimension. The third dimension is where you stand with uh, tech... Uh, bioconservatism versus uh, embracing technology, that many people are conservatives in the sense of they, they say they're quite happy for gadgets, but they don't want the idea of any technology coming into the body and changing genes and uh, allowing people to have babies outside of the womb and all these things. So yuck, 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 yuck. So there's a bioconservatives, whereas the others say, yeah, let's have as much of this technology. It's great to be able to have uh, drugs that bypass the need to do 30 years of meditation, get into the zone just with a drug or two. And and that's there where people will say, you know, there are more important questions than just left wing and right wing and economics. There are all these other dimensions which might become even more important. I guess some people will say it's more important as well where you stand on the nation state. Some people will say that's the defining question for some of them. So uh, that was just a, a long Yeah, no, it's a good aside. Yeah, I totally agree. And that's partly, partly people not willing to accept the very narrow political choices that you have in centre-left and centre-right politics. And the fragmentation of the Labour Party, in a sense, is a bit of that sort of being expressed. But listen, I have to leave at four o'clock on the dot for a train to Manchester from, from Houston. So we have to, I oh, will have to finish at four, I'm afraid. So maybe, so, yeah, perfect, perfect, perfect. So you focused a lot on the decline of faith in institutions across the board. Yeah. And you also spoke specifically each case about an individual that was driving a new wave of thought. This also goes to the YouTube piece. Is there something to be said for leaders of new movements, both from the media side and from the radical movement side, that it's easier to brand an individual as a concept to gain interest and, in that sense, you can push an idea forward more quickly than if you're trying to drive it from inside with that whole affiliation angle? Yeah, and I think that my, just the, 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 my, I've based it on a series of anecdotal stories, really. So it's not this is not driven by. I'm sure there's a big academic literature on this that I'm not aware of, but certainly as a journalist coming in and looking at it, it was easier to tell the story through the prism of an individual. Uh, and so, the English Defence League would not have become as popular without Tommy Robinson. And if it had been a leaderless group, it wouldn't have worked. The media wouldn't have known who to go to. There wasn't this focal point. The same with transhumanism. I think it did need that kind of that person at the top. And the same with Liberland. You know, having a president that does all the interviews, that does all the glad handling of people, and um, the organisational sort of form of the direct action environmentalist without a leader was just so much harder to kind of make some sense of. And maybe that's just a human weakness, that we need a figurehead and a person to symbolise something and it makes it digestible for us. 
certainly that's my experience. But like I said, there is probably a literature on this that would know better than my anecdotes. Um, yeah. You mentioned uh, Zoltan Isfan. Um, uh, you, you described uh, a couple of times that he was doing something risky. Yes. Um, I, was, I was quite fascinated by that, actually. Um, beyond, you know, maybe potentially just wasting a month or so of his time, what, what, what do you mean by that? Can you give Bec a little well, bit more yeah. colour? Yes. Well, yes. Well, I mean, firstly, yes, there was the risk that he was uh, embarrassing himself with a ridiculous campaign, and he, I think he does have political ambitions. This is why he's now running as a libertarian. And I think the risk, he, he felt there was a risk of him looking foolish and actually discrediting himself in future. Uh, so he had that risk, uh, but I think he made the right choice in the end because at the moment it feels like, and I feel this with my book, like if I say something absolutely outrageous and ridiculous, everyone will be outraged for five minutes, but then my na you know, they'll remember me and then they'll buy my book. So I have an incentive to be outrageous and it kind of works. And it's not very healthy necessarily, but... But then there was the, the FEC rules that I mentioned, the way that he had, he was technically in breach of FEC, so uh, Federal Electoral Commission rules about claiming to be the leader of a party that does not exist and raising money for a party that does not exist. And that is risky. I mean, I don't know what exactly the consequences of that are, and as far as I can see, nothing's actually happened. But that's a risky thing to do. I think Zoltan so was, was also aware that he would lose some of his friendships with some of the more perhaps slow-moving transhumanists. Yes, what, which did happen. I mean, it did, he, it did cause him to fall out with, with personal friends of his as a result. So. Yeah. But all radicals end up taking risks. I mean, everyone in this book is taking personal or professional risks to do the things that What's they the do. What's the phrase? If you want to make an omelette, you've got to break a few eggs. <laughs> exactly. Right. So just in the interest of... Uh, 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 Fleshing out the rest of the story, the U.S. Transhumanist Party is still very much alive and well. It has a new leader. Zoltan handed it over to somebody called Gennady Stolyarov, uh, I think a Bulgarian uh, American, uh, living in uh, what? Nevada. Thank you. And so they have uh, done. Uh, Maybe they're not driving an immortality bus, but they've got uh, a much more detailed set of proposals with a whole bunch of planks. So if you are interested in how a movement might go from having a bit of r razzmatazz publicity and then p uh, try to strengthen itself as a more central, thoughtful position, I, I encourage you to look at what the Transhumanist Party in the US has done. And uh, there is somebody in the audience today, I don't know if you mind, Julian, if I identify you. Julian is running a similar movement in the UK called the UK Transhumanist Party. Julian hasn't committed to driving a, a, a bus between here and a... Uh, I don't know, Stonehenge <laughs> or wherever, to, to, but uh, open to ideas. So if you think uh, you want to get behind that and offer some suggestions as to how we can change uh, uh, awareness of uh, big technological issues, because frankly, if you look at the main uh, political parties' uh, uh, manifestos, they give lip service to perhaps Britain being the most innovative country in the world. I think I read in the Conservative Manifesto, they give lip service to more focus on technology but I think transhumanists would take it that they're not doing anything like enough to understand how this will work in practice and that how the crisis in the NHS, which is a crisis, could most effectively be solved by bringing forward a healthy longevity, in which case people wouldn't be getting ill and there'd be a much better solution. So there's nothing like enough attention to these issues and the transhumanists in the UK are interested in your ideas as to how to take that argument forwards. Now, Jamie, you need to catch HS1, not HS2, up north yeah, yeah. Uh, pretty soon. So let's uh, just mention that plenty more happening with London Futurist. You'll see the details online. If you stay in this room, I'll put up a, a rolling uh, presentation of some of our next meetings. And uh, although Jamie can't join us in the pub, uh, the, some of us certainly will be there at Marlborough Arms where you can uh, go into some of these hard questions that Jamie gently deflected, saying, well, that's <laughs> for us and not for him. But Jamie, thanks so much <laughs> for uh, leading us through this. Everybody. <laughs> Radicals is available at all good booksellers. That's right. And even one or two here today. I've got a couple of copies if anyone wants one.